And now, the guy with boundless energy, rampant enthusiasm, and infectious charm, our host, Al Colton. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Boston's number one primetime and late night TV talk variety comedy show. We're going to be talking about the election tonight, Trump, Clinton, and to start us off, we went to Man on the Street interviews in Boston, Somerville, Cambridge, and so let's take a look at what people have to say about the candidates and the election. Take a look. We are in Union Square, Somerville, Central Square, Cambridge, Boylston Street, Boston, Boston Common, Boston, all over the place, asking people what they know about Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump. Should be exciting or not. Let's go. Can you tell me who's running for president? Um, right now, Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton. Okay. Do you know the difference between Donald Trump and a potato? Not much. I mean, I think it makes more executive decisions than him. Well, no, let me not say that. It I makes <laughs> it makes better. I don't know. I don't know how to put it. How should I phrase it? it? Makes. I don't know. He's just smarter all the way around. So, can you tell me who's running for president? Hillary Clinton, Donald Trump. Okay. Do you know Hillary's middle name? Rodham. Uh, Rodham. Uh, Rodham. Dodd or some. I don't remember exactly. Uh, do you know Donald Trump's middle name? No. Do you know Donald Trump's running mate? Yes. <laughs> no, it's a question. Oh. <laughs> no. I mean, we know the names, but we're not. We pray for the work. We're of a different kingdom. Donald Trump's running mate's name? I have no idea. How <laughs> about uh, Hillary Clinton? Hillary Clinton. I'm not sure either. Do you know who's running for president? Um government uh, I can't remember <laughs> something about a vegetable salad strikes me as being more honest you know you know where your calories are coming from and if you check if there's any GMOs you know what you know if there's any hormones or whatnot make sure it's coming from an ethical harvest with Hillary I don't know <laughs> so can we ask you some questions about the election Donald Trump and hot potato Ah, hot potato, it gets cool down. It doesn't, you know, like, burst out. Burst out too much, like, he doesn't have a control. What's the difference between Hillary Clinton and a fruit salad? Fruit salad, uh, she's a lot less popular than fruit salad. Oh! I learned that, um, I heard that, um, like, I guess the Clintons, like I guess they have money that they that that um and do the um I heard that fruit salad isn't particularly popular in and of itself, but uh probably a bit more welcome at most parties. So can you tell me Donald Trump's middle name? I cannot. Uh Donald Trump's running mate. Nope. A potato is a vegetable. Would you vote for a heterosexual for president? Hetero who? Who's that? Is that Donald Trump? Or something? No, just would you vote for any heterosexual for president? If, if I, you know, if he's doing good shit, like, of course, you know. I mean, I have no problem with no any, you know, gay people or anything. I mean, as long as they're going to help this, the, the country. And there you have it, man on the street, what people know about the election and the candidates that are running. Up next, our special guest for the night, Rob Rice, analyzing the debate of last night, the first presidential debate. We'll be back after this break. Stay with us. Following is a paid advertisement of the Rocket Lifestyle. These views are exposed to not especially reflect the views of the network. Struggling getting the distance? Tired of being a hack? Has your distance got you down? Hi, 
I'm Rick the Rocket Rogers, known for my patented 2.5 mile rocket And I'm here to teach you about going the distance in golf and in life. You think I went from zero to long like that? The Rocket. Before you pay, was the 1776 was non refundable, non reimbursable, nothing you can do at all about this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Welcome back to the show. My guest tonight is a master's degree, has a master's degree. He's not a master's degree himself. We'll talk about that. He is Rob Rice with a bachelor's, bachelor's with a bachelor's master's degree from Tulane University, and that's a mouthful. Rob, welcome to the show. Hello. Hello. Thank you very much for welcoming me to the show. Well, you're very welcome. Such a mouthful. Thank you for coming on to the show. I appreciate uh, being had after all of those lead ins with those various sort of illustrious people. I feel honored to follow them. Well, good. Did you see the debate last night, the first presidential debate? I, I saw and the debate, Trump? Uh, as did, I think, 100 million other people, right? Wow, we weren't alone. We certainly weren't alone. Uh, I don't know, I guess being born when I was born and being raised in my generation, things like that, like sort of communal experiences like that that are shared by 100 million people are more and more rare for us, right? And, and maybe that has to do with uh, the studio system being sort of fragmented out into so many more than three networks. But I think for us, we start to crave these things like terrorist attacks or sort of mass tragedies because it's the only thing we all are sort of experiencing at one time because otherwise we're so sort of fragmented out in different directions. So I think like whatever will follow in our discussion about, uh, you know, like the sort of the ways in which the candidates are letting us down like they're always letting us down should at least be prefaced by saying it's still cool to have a communal experience like that as in our generation we're not used to it. Imagine a extravagant jumbotron with a hundred million people watching. Yeah, and being the person who has to sustain that interest. Yes. Yeah. How did you think um, Lester Holt, the moderator, did? Holt, uh, I think he held his own. Better than Brock Holt? Better than Brock Holt, even okay. better. Yeah. Even better. There's been criticism that he didn't interrupt when Trump interrupted Clinton. Yeah. Even yeah. I mean, I, like think it's different. I think it's difficult for him to do that. It becomes just sort of disorganized when everybody's interrupting everybody. And I don't think he's capable of overpowering him. And I think there had, some executive decision had to come down to say, like, you're not going to best this guy, so you might as well just like, let him deal with it. And I guess the only fair chance Hillary has is for people to see that she's able to handle Trump when he's being obnoxious like that, right? Because if Holt just jumps in, probably there is some way in which Trump can sort of warp that into his favor as well. Right? Shut off his, shut off Trump's mic. Yeah, just like maybe they could do something like that, but that would seem too extreme, and it would seem like you know, like uh, everyone's out to get Trump, just like Trump has told us. Extreme measures for extreme people. Sure, but I think it, people that extreme sort of just take it all in, like the uh, that like big expanding cloud in. Uh, the fifth element, where they shoot those rockets into it and it just gets bigger and bigger, right? Yep. It's like anything that like sort of puny humans are able to do, it like, like only fortifies it. Did you notice any change in Trump's persona from the first portion of the debate to the latter portion? Um, I mean, I think it came out with a lot of energy and I think doing his like sort of no preparation, just having vigor Thing eventually is exhausting when you realize like you don't have a lot of prepared answers for the things that are inevitably going to come your way. So maybe it seemed like he was a little bit defeated, but I think just for me watching it from an effective point of view, just like thinking about what is the most emotionally convincing, it still seems like he's the most powerful person. And I think unfortunately a lot of people, like those debates aren't being debated for the minds of informed political participants, right? They're just being debated so that people can see like which person just viscerally is more powerful. And I think it's difficult for Hillary to be as prepared and coached as she is because it seems like she's sort of 
preaching only to the converted and is not going to convert any of the people who are there just to see the blood splatter. That was my next question. Do you think anyone was converted in their minds to change their to change their perception from one to the other? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't really have a good idea of how many people are on the fringes and how many people are undecided. I think a lot of people, you know, like it's sort of free to make up your mind, and I think a lot of people like treat themselves to that luxury. I, I, I don't believe that there are that many people who are actually coming in with a sort of open mind and saying, well, like, let's see who prepares for me the more cogent arguments. I think they've already assessed just, you know, like w which person is stronger, and they've gone with them. I don't really know. Maybe there are some people who thought Hillary would be totally sort of bulldozed by him and saw her not being so and so changed their minds or decided in her favor. I bet that if anyone gained any followers, she did and he didn't. But I bet pretty few are in that group. Yep. What do you think? Did you notice that he was a little more emotional towards the end of the debate? Than, and than reacting? Than usual or than she was? Because certainly than she was. Uh, emotional in terms of um, feeling that he's been hit and he needs to hit back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think I think that probably is the best thing Hillary could have had happen, right? Just to have him, you know, because like, he, he so much creates his own world and rules that the only person who can tell you anything about those rules is him, right? Like if someone says, oh, Trump was very upset, and then the media people at whatever conference he has next quote that to him, they said, oh, the Washington Post said you were upset. He can say, no, that's not true, um, Donald Trump, and I make the rules, right? But like if he is acting on what is obviously having been made upset, then that sort of validates it, even in the like bizarro land of the Trump logic. He sort of told us that she got to him. So I think that's effective for her. Are you surprised by the poll numbers that have them so close together? I don't know. I don't know how those things work. I, no, I, I would say that I didn't feel like hugely swayed by one or the other or was hugely surprised by one of the other's performance. What about you? I thought that Trump's true colors came out after the middle of the debate. Yeah when he started reacting to Hillary's mentioning his father gave, giving him, his father's giving him $14 million. He claims right. it was just $1 million. She claims it was $14 million. Right. And I think he reacted rather strongly to, as he has in the past, about releasing his taxes. Definitely. You know, he'll release his taxes when she releases 30,000 destroyed emails. Right which doesn't make sense. You know, one is apples, the other is oranges. Right. And the taxes. whole argument about our emails is that like, having them on that private server made it dangerous because they were sensitive. So like, having them released is preposterous. The whole point, the whole problem with what she did is that those emails like, shouldn't be seen by the wrong people. Right. So there's no releasing those emails. That's not, like, no one is asking her to do that. Maybe there are people who are asking her to answer for having had them on a private server. But there aren't people asking, like, well, let's see the emails. Yep. That's ridiculous. Other than DT, Donald Trump. Right. We're going to take a brief break. We'll be back after these messages with Rob Rice and more of the show. Stay with us.
Thank you. Welcome back to the show. We are speaking with Rob Rice. Let's talk about you and your background because you have a bachelor's, master's degree from Tulane University in neuroscience. That's true. Yet I know you more as an artiste. That's true. Uh, so is there a, is there well, a yeah, connection yeah, yeah. between the two? I don't the think two? in any way they are disconnected, right? I think the people who are interested in neuroscience for the right reasons are interested in it because it's sort of mind boggling that matter becomes imagination, right? That like the same stuff that makes up rocks and rivers makes up your sort of conception of rocks and rivers, right? And the only thing that makes that interesting, I think, is that you think imagination is cool. Right, and it's like worth spending your time thinking about. What made you decide to go into neuroscience? Um, I don't know. I don't know that I had a very clear notion of why I wanted to do that in the beginning. I think one of the sort of convenience aspects of it is that a lot of the core stuff that it makes you do aligns closely with the pre-med stuff. So that's why a lot of other kids were doing it. And I sort of jumped on that bandwagon. Uh, maybe because sort of subconsciously I understood that I enjoyed it, but sort of on the on the surface because I thought it was an expedient. But it turned out, one, that I don't want to be a doctor, and two, that I liked it in a more sort of wishy-washy way than the other people. Did you ever think about being a physician? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I guess my idea of it always would was to be a psychiatrist, right, which is like some sort of weird strata of position already, but I think pretty quickly I realized that I didn't want to be that. I guess that all of the doctors that I knew were of a different personality type than I thought I was becoming. Right. So did you decide not to go into neuroscience after you got your degree, or is it still? Yeah, well, I mean, I think, like I said in the beginning, I wasn't being totally facetious. I think like going into neuroscience is a anything, right? Like it, delving into anything is delving into neuroscience. I think it, it like sort of follows you everywhere as a condition, like it, it must. And I think forever in whatever I do, it will be a like lens through which I perceive that thing, right? So I, I'll bring it with me. And also, sort of strictly speaking, in the world of neuroscience, you can be a physician, you can be an MD, you can also be a research doctor, right? You can be a PhD and just find out neuroscience stuff and not apply it in, in the same way, right? And you can help like pharmaceutical people apply it. But uh, so yeah, I guess initially I wanted to be a doctor uh, and then I worried I didn't want to do that. I sort of worried that I didn't want to do it because I was afraid of the test you have to take to become that thing, which is the MCAT. So then I took that test so that I didn't make a decision out of fear, but very much I still didn't want to be a doctor. So then I thought, oh, uh, maybe I'm more creative. I should be a research doctor. I should go into uh, the PhD world. That's why I did the master's. Also, just so I could hang out in New Orleans for another year, but I did the master's, and then I came here to do this job, and still I don't think I want to be a, a researcher. Is the job you're doing now related to neuroscience? Yes, it's like the genetics and neuroscience oh, okay. stuff, but it sucks. It sucks to do, I mean, it's just incredibly minute, and it's incredibly sort of slogging and boring, and the uh, like conceptual stuff that you get to think about as just a student, you don't get to think, you're like, no one's going to pay you to think about rivers and rocks, right? Like, people want you to think about druggable targets and deliverables, right? And so that stuff doesn't interest me at all. Are, and you, are you glad you went to Tulane? Very much. Very What's much. it like going to school in New Orleans? Incredible. Uh, I think that uh, people have a hugely varied experience of it, right, because people can exist within the little Tulane bubble, which is very much a part of the wealthy part of New Orleans, which has its own sort of storied history that's worth interacting with. But I think the thing that is special about New Orleans isn't totally apparent there, right? And that thing that is special about New Orleans is the like sort of cultural richness of it. But I think unlike a lot of culturally rich American cities, you don't have to just observe it, right? You can also like have some access to it. And the only prerequisite for that is just going to the places where it's going on, right? Like those people are totally willing to bring you into it and have you experience it in an actual way, unlike other places where there is some cultural storied richness, but you can just go and observe it. And I think a lot of that uh, tension around post-Katrina sort of tourism had to do with those kind of 
uh, like tinted window vans where people went around just taking pictures of the flooded Ninth Ward and stuff. And I think that sort of violated the essential thing about New Orleans is that like the Ninth Ward or the poor parts of the city are open to everybody and you're like welcome to experience the verve that created jazz and blues, but you, like seems ridiculous to sort of museumify it like that because it's still active. Is, is Tulane known at all as a party school because of its situation, because of its being situated in New Orleans? Yeah, I think maybe independently it is a party school and it would be in Iowa or whatever, but I think it, it certainly just catalyzes it being in New Orleans. I mean, there's a huge fraternity life, like an enormous majority of kids are in a fraternity. And then also Mardi Gras goes on and things that New Orleans is known for. Go What's on. it like during Mardi Gras? Incredibly Crazy. bizarre. Yeah, uh, there's a lot of like sort of fat people from Iowa and whatever that you'd expect, right? You know, like sort of people drinking huge pitcher-sized beers and that stuff can swallow you up for your first two or three years being there, right? And you can just be a part of that world the whole time, right? The whole week is sustained by, the, I mean, it's like, it's many weekends leading up to pretty much a full week of parades and sort of just general craziness. And you can just be swallowed up in the uptown part of it. And I was for maybe two years. Really? And definitely. And it, it's almost impossible as a student to get away from that stuff. And then you can find the like much weirder and darker and cooler and scarier real city stuff going on if you go further into the actual city, which it takes people, it takes, oh, like a lot of Tulane students have no experience of that stuff. So, yeah, like I never find that. Really? Sure. Is there, a, is there a competition between Loyola and Tulane? Certainly not. Certainly not? No. I mean, and they're, it's not even considered. Really? Yeah. Are there inter-school um, contests or competitions? No. They, they have their own whole world. Like they put a, they do this huge thing every year where they put all the crosses out in the front of their church, in this huge lawn in front of the church of all the lives lost since Roe v. Wade. And so we leave them alone. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, they're super bizarre. There's a, in New Orleans, there's a big competition between Tulane and LSU. Not really big, pretty much everyone goes with the LSU football people. But there's some like sports rivalry, maybe like baseball or something. I'm not totally sure. But I mm -hmm. think LSU wins that one. And Tulane versus Loyola, Tulane wins. There's a Loyola College of Chicago. Is that related yeah. to Loyola? I don't know how all the Loyolas are broken up. There's one in Los Angeles, too. Loyola, oh, really? Marymount. I don't know. The church. Are you glad you went there for the five or six, is it five or six years? That five years. Five years of master's? Pretty good. Pretty good. Uh, yes, I'm glad that I went there very much. I'm sad that I'm no longer still there. I would have stayed there much longer. When did you graduate? Uh, the 2014 as an undergrad, 2015 as an Oh, so recently. Yeah. So you were there post-Katrina. Yeah, all post-Katrina. Many, many years post-Katrina. So I don't... Do you keep I, in I touch can't. with fellow students? Yeah, I know a few of them. I have some people that I lived with that still live in the same apartments that I lived with them in. And oh, they're still there? They're still there. And I have people that I grew up with in Northampton, in Western Mass, that like came down to live with me, and then I left, and now live with my college friends who didn't previously know each other. If you had a choice and you could do anything you wanted to do at this point in your life, what would you choose to do? Uh, Screenwrite. Screenwrite? Yes. And where did that come from? Within. Within. Yeah. Uh, I don't know where it came from. My childhood and adolescence. Did that come up when you were deciding what, where, where to go to college? You, they, the screen no, I had a, like a lot of confusion to work. I mean, that's a sort of recent development that I have such a sort of specific answer to that question for you. I think there was a lot of time spent uh, trying to define myself in the shadow of my brother's trajectory, which is much more arts oriented. Oh, really? And like as a sort of snotty little kid, uh, I had a classic bit I would do with my mom where if we were on the beach and she would say like, here, Robert, put this sunscreen on, I would always say like, mom, I don't need any sunscreen. I'm living in the shade. And I meant like of my big brother's shadow. Uh, How many siblings do you have? 
I have only one brother who's six years older. And he's a sort of arts-oriented dude. And so that's probably why it took me so long to find my way there. And my dad is a psychiatrist who spends all of his time as a sculptor. And so really? that sort of dichotomy probably has a lot the to do with The acorn doesn't my... fall far from the tree. Certainly not. Certainly so not. is your father's experience as a psychiatrist something that you took with you and said, I don't want to be, or I do want to be no, a No, I think he's a total exception to what being a doctor is. Uh, In what way? When he did, you know, he's did it a long time ago when the landscape of the medical school world and the medical world were much different and more contemplative and less competitive. Uh, and he has a sort of private practice in the mountains of Massachusetts where he just sort of gets to do psychotherapy, where he just talks to people. He refuses to prescribe anything. He just like sort of feels it out emotionally with people, which I think is probably as artistic as his sculpture practice, right? But these days, I, I don't think it's possible to be a psychiatrist and not just be a person who prescribes medication. So being a psychiatrist is definitely not in the books for you in the future? Uh, not in an official regard, but if you need help with anything, Oh, definitely. I'm happy to help. Yeah, I have a lot of uh, cognitive dissonance questions. Sure. Shoot. I don't know of any offhand, right. but they come up from time to time. Yeah, uh, there's a lot, of, a lot of dissonance out there. Yeah, and speaking of dissonance, getting back to the election again, are you forecasting who you think will win? Uh, I, I, I think Hillary will win. I have that faith in us. I think the angry people are smarter than we give them credit for being. The angry people are smarter? Yeah, I think it's a sort of like no oh, moment people that of, are for Trump will eventually. Yeah, 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 the Trump people who like calm and by themselves in a booth don't have to like, be a part of the mass hysteria can vote for whoever they want to. And I bet some of them are more level-headed than it is necessary in their communities to be. What do you think of the vice presidential candidates? Because that debate is the next debate coming. Yeah, I, I really am not impressed by either one of them. I, you know, they they both seem like I don't know s obvious political stabilizers, right? Like a guys whose role for each of the candidates makes complete sense. And I would like for the political people at that high level to be. You know, like doing stuff behind the scenes that is beyond my ability to comprehend, right? Like I have this romantic idea of them as incredibly su successfully manipulative, and I wish that they were doing something that was less transparent. And it seems like Pence just stabilizes in a way that I understand, and so does Tim. Tim Kaine, by the way, that is something that a lot of people were unaware of in the Man on the Street interview, how many people actually knew their running mates. Yeah. Yeah. And you know. Much. I know them. Yes. You are on the upper echelon of. Of the men on the street. Of the men on the street. That's right. This has been um, quick, and I really appreciate you coming on as a guest on short notice. Rob Rice, thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Thank you for being here. And we will be back next week with another show. So see you then.